Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week, we, this week in Weather. I'm your host and meteorologist, DT, here from Weather Risk, your captain of chaos, your colonel of confusion, your commander of catastrophe. Let's talk about this week in weather. This report got a little delayed here. As you know, it took several days off and a lot of work and a big storm coming up for the weekend, so the paying clients have to get the information first. So, so even though I wanted to get the thing out earlier this afternoon, just too much work, especially coming back after a break. Anyway, so let's talk about it. This here for October 9th, our topics here with the first nor'easter, coastal low of the season, and looking at the first week of October snow cover buildup in Siberia. So let's get right to it. This here is the Weather is Strange Twitter page, which I'm sure you've seen, or I hope you've seen from time to time. This is mostly for my grain uh, commodities and uh, international trade stuff, stuff like that. And then here is the Blue Sky page, which I do the, mostly the uh, localized weather here, here in the eastern United States, and the mid-Atlantic, New England, uh, east coast, what have you. And of course, always we have the mid-Atlantic operational forecast for only $35 a month. Very useful product, but this big storm coming up here, coming out every day now, uh, with all the rain and the wind. And you can see the, uh, the 12 different zones here, the lower mid-Atlantic, and you get your wind, your rain, your temperatures, precipitation coverage, a couple of maps, and a week two forecast, all for 35 bucks a month can't beat it. Best, bar best bargain out there next to the three weeks newsletter. And of course, you can get the three week newsletter, by the way, if you look for it here on the shop page as well. That's how you get it down here, access the subscription. And the three week newsletter, only $5 a month. Can't beat it either. All right, this here is the uh, mid Atlantic, oh, excuse me, this is the sea surface temperature map, I should say, and the anomalies as of October 8th. And you can see the Pacific is very warm again. It's a little cooling here. Um, in the Northeast Pacific, but I just, I think that's just minor, that's just noise. I don't think that's a really big change one way or the other. And you can see the La Nina do, developing nicely right here along the Equatorial Pacific. Not a very strong one, not a very deep one, but it definitely is there. Here's the latest graph on the sea surface temperature map. And you can see at one point, oops, let me bring this forward here. At one point, uh, we were actually down to minus 0 0.7 centigrade, then it jumped back up again. Uh, so this is a, an oscillating week. Uh, uh, La, La Nina is what this is. And again, most of the data doesn't show it's going to last. This here is the European projection from October 5, uh, just a couple of days ago. And you can see the black line, this was the old projection of the ensemble mean. So this, see the blue color here? This is basic minimum threshold for La Nina. So we're between minus 0 0.5 and there's minus 1. And the red line represents the ensemble mean of all these different red lines here. You see that? So what that shows is that um, the, the ensemble mean has, is a little colder than it was October compared to September 5, but almost the same thing. And it reaches its peak here, you can see November, December. By January, we are in neutral conditions again. So if anything, it means that the La Nina is steepening a little bit, but it's also coming up faster. So a very short duration event. And you can see by the latest what's going on here with the sea surface temperatures, this is not really intensifying. All right. Now the MJO for the next, um, for the next uh, uh, three or four weeks here, this is the latest projection here from the uh, European Ensemble. And it's uh, useful stuff. I get the purple color the next five days in phase one. Then we go into phase two, phase three, and phase four. By the time we get to the... Uh, you know, and then maybe even phase five, time we get to the 15 to 20 days. So this covers the rest of October for the most part. And if we look at the temperature biases, the precipitation bias in the month of October, phase two is pretty wet on the East Coast. Well, we're definitely going to see that here with the Nor'easter. In phase three, the rain kind of shifts more towards the southern states, and it's dry in the Great Lakes, uh, the upper Midwest, New England. Phase four, it's hit and miss everywhere, kind of a mixed bag there. And then phase five, it's dry for most of the central and eastern half of the country. With respect to temperatures, it's generally a cool pattern for the rest of October, uh, phase two, phase three, phase four, and five. All the real heat is in the upper Midwest or the Rockies or what have you. So uh, it's not a bad pattern for the rest of October. All right, let's talk about the Nor'easter. Now, this is the European map from Tuesday, all right? And uh, the European map, uh, all, the models have been handling this really well. I'm just showing you one example of it. The GFS has done a good job with this. The British model, the, the Canadian to some degree, the ICON, the German model, which needs to get a lot more respect. That is proving to be a pretty good model. But in any event, okay, this is the European model. You can see what it's doing. It has the low parked on Sunday morning just off of Hatteras, and you get these tremendous winds. Let me see if I can blow. I'm going to bring this forward so you can see a little more. 
and blow this up here. And you can see, look at that wind gradient, right? This is Sunday after this after the king tide. You can see these howling winds here. Um, you know, the wind's coming in from the northeast direction, really piling water up. And this thing does not move at all. This is Sunday and from uh, the European model. Again, this is from Tuesday. And then the updated version, or the, excuse me, the next run, as you can see, uh, a couple of days, a couple of hours later. Let me take a look, blow this up here. This is, um, I'll bring this front here so you can see it some more. And I'll blow this up here. This is now uh, Monday morning at 2 a.m. And the thing has moved very little from Cape Hatteras to here in over 18, 24 hours. You can see the tremendous rain coming in here, pounding Virginia, almost all of Virginia here, into the Delmarva, New Jersey, uh, southeast Pennsylvania. And the rains are slowly approaching New England. Now, we do have the big high to the north, so there's some question as to how far north the heavy precipitation is going to get. So that is an issue. Now, other models were parking the system off of here, off of south, south southern North Carolina, uh, and which was again affecting how much precipitation was going to come inland and so on and so forth. So this has been a well advertised uh, system that something big is going to happen. So that's the issue. And that's why I talked about it back on Monday and Tuesday about the potential for a major nor'easter. Now this is the, um, again, this is now from uh, October 7th European model valid for the evening of October 13th and the lowest part still over Norfolk, Virginia or Elizabeth City. So what happens is, as you can see, the low, let me clear this, change it. Okay, so it comes up and then what happens is it um, stalls and then it rotates back down towards Hatteras. See, rotates back towards Hatteras and Norfolk. That's what it does. And uh, a lot of the models are showing that. Part of that is because of the huge blocking pattern here, and you can see the Greenland block developing. We'll get to that in a second. But also, there's a huge ocean low in the Northwest Atlantic Ocean, and that's a significant feature as well, which should not be overlooked. So this is the upper air pattern. So this is now the 12Z. This is the Thursday, operationally European. Now, um, you can see the upper low dropping in the northern branch, and there's the southern low over Georgia. So these two features are going to meet, and they're going to close off here. And they're going to do that because this trough is going to go kablooey in Northwest Atlantic Ocean, really whammo. It's going to explode. And when it does, it's going to screw up the whole pattern. Let me show you what I mean here. So, okay, this is the operationally European. This is now the U.S. projection for uh, Monday. The low is closed off right over Salisbury, Richmond, Norfolk, I don't know, something like that. In the middle, the lower mid-Atlantic, you can see it. Huge block over, over Quebec. If this was winter, this would be a monster storm. And this is, you know, I don't know if this means anything for the winter or not. We're getting into, you know, mid-October here. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. This is a nice big rainstorm. So, uh, but the significance is whether or not this is how, whether or not this nor'easter means anything for the winter. It's impossible to know at this point. It really is. Now, this is what I wanted to point out. This is the same projection. Okay, that was 102 hours. This is valid for 18Z Monday, 2 o'clock Monday. This is valid for early on Tuesday morning. Look at that huge storm in uh, south of Greenland or just uh, to the northeast of Newfoundland. Look at this monster. This thing is massive. I can't wait to see what this looks like on a satellite picture. Oh my God, this thing looks huge. But the important point is this, the mid-Atlantic low cannot move as this storm blocking it. See that? If this wasn't here, this thing would be long gone. But on Tuesday morning, it's still raining and storming on the mid-Atlantic coast. Yeah, yeah. If we get something like this in the winter, wow, just wow. Anyway, okay, and of course you have this huge, giant, another one up below um, off the California coast in San Francisco, pounding the hell out of those guys. So, you know, you can see the equilibrium and the pattern here, the, the symmetry in the pattern. Very interesting. All right, so this is, now this was the 6Z European model from this Thursday morning, okay, the 6Z run. And uh, the European, you can see Saturday morning, Saturday evening, okay, the low is approaching uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. And notice it is significantly further south and it's significantly slower. And then here we go, Sunday, 11 a.m. So what happens is the first low occludes, okay? It reaches an occlusion point right here. And it rotates to the north and, the, and you have a bagginess left behind, a weak low behind it. So uh, you can see that here. You notice, you see what the model's doing? There's the, this low. Okay, reforms, and now it's east of Hatteras, way east of Hatteras. And the second low is hanging back over near the coast. 
So now all your rain is restricted now to the eastern coastal areas. You're not getting that much rain in the interior, according to the 6E European. See, the rain looks fairly light here in central and northwestern Virginia. And you're getting light to moderate rain in New York and Philly and Boston, but it's not great. Now, the heavy rain looks like it's coming northward, but again, here comes the low rotating up the coast, up the coast, and then it begins to rotate back southward again. Let me show you what I mean. The European now brings it back towards New Jersey. Now you're getting heavy rain in the big cities of I-95, and then the low rotates back towards Norfolk by Monday, 10 p.m. Now, this looks really far east to me, given the upper air pattern. Maybe this is right, but this looks really far east to me. And if you look at the rainfall map, look at that. All the rain is way east of Interstate 95, and all the heavy rain in the Mid-Atlantic is New Jersey and into the coastal New England, which is and eastern North Carolina, and a little bit into Norfolk. But you know, once you go past, well, Richmond only gets a quarter of an inch on this, if you can believe that. I think that's bullshit. I think this is wrong. Way too much light rain here. I just think this whole scenario is wrong. It's got the right idea. It's just it's too far east. All right. And interestingly, when you compare the European to the ensemble, it's much wetter. Much wetter. So much wetter it is in the middle in there. Now, all again, all the heavy rain is still along the coast, but it's got, you know, you got all it rain in Richmond and you've got significant rain into up to Charlottesville and places. So it, it the rain is there. So, you know, they're very different solutions. So this tells me the 6Z European model is bullshit. Just, just I'm just going to ignore it. All right. Now, here's the uh, 12Z GFS. Now, this model I like a little better here. Well, let me change that. Let me put it away. Here we go. You can see it. Here's the low, 2 o'clock Saturday, Saturday afternoon. Heavy, heavy rain, northeast North Carolina, Myrtle Beach, eastern, eastern half of North, of North Carolina, especially eastern third of North Carolina. The rain is just getting into Norfolk, Richmond, and Salisbury. Now, Sunday at 8 a.m., look where this thing is. This thing barely moves. All right? This is... Um, 16, 18 hours later, this thing hasn't moved at all. Now look, the low is over Hatteras, or maybe in the Upper Mall Sound, and you're getting heavy rain driving deep into Virginia and Maryland and Delaware up to southern Pennsylvania. Moderate rain in Pittsburgh or Altoona, if you can believe that, southern New Jersey. It's not quite yet into New York or Boston or southern New England, but it's coming. This thing really wraps up on the GFS. I think this solution is pretty, pretty good, actually. All right, so, um, oops, let me get this map here. Okay, now this is Sunday, 10 p.m. It's in Salisbury. So it goes from, look at this, okay? It goes from uh, very slowly from 2 o'clock southeast, let's say Wilmington, 8 o'clock Sunday morning, Hatteras, and then Norfolk, Sunday, 10 p.m.? And then by Monday, 5 p.m., it's over D.C. It hasn't moved. It's moved very little over this last time frame. So this is quite remarkable. Uh, this is a, a slow-moving nor'easter because of the block to the north and also because of the huge ocean storm. Again, yeah, I can't emphasize how important this sucker is. And it's going to keep them on the coast. Again, if we get something like that in the winter, oh boy, it's going to be something, let me tell you. So um, here now, so that is the... Uh, GFS, 12Z GFS, right? And this is the 18Z run. Just to give you an update on it, again, the low is very close. Let me bring it forward here. Uh, you can see the low is very close to Hatteras. This is Saturday, 8 p.m. Okay, maybe Moorhead City. Okay, Sunday, 8 p.m., Norfolk. Okay, tremendous rains in central and eastern Virginia, all up into Pennsylvania, much more heavy rain. See, this is much heavier rain you see on the European. Much heavier rain. Driving the east wind, driving that moisture in, this makes good sense to me. Look at these southeast winds driving that moisture in. This makes much more sense to me. All right, I like that scenario a lot. And then this is sun, This is a Monday evening, 8 p.m. It's just all over Delmarva. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's, it, it is <laughs> it's a doozy. This is going to be a hell of a storm. So, um... Yeah, I'm impressed. And if you look at the uh, rainfall output here, you can see, again, um, the, um, the GFS heavy rain here over central and eastern Virginia, way, way inland from the European and the, and the Canadian to some degree. All right. So I think that's the solution. Another one here is um, the uh, Icon model, the German model. And the German model doesn't get a lot of love, and I think it should. Um, especially after like 144, 108, 68 hours, it's really pretty good. And I like it a lot more than the Canadian. I don't. Th I, I think it's uh, has a better physics package, a parameterization, 
better than the Canadian. The Canadian looks too progressive, sometimes too warm, in my opinion. I like the I like the Icon model a lot here, and uh, I'm going to be talking about it a bit from time to time. Here's the Icon model doing the same thing that the GFS is doing. See how it hugs the coast? This is Saturday, 2 p.m. This is a Sunday, um, 8 p.m. It doesn't move. Whew. That's impressive. That is impressive. Look at those winds just feeding that moisture in. I'm telling you. Got a, a icon model looks looking pretty good. It's doing a pretty good job here. And then it rotates off the coast, and you're still getting occasional showers on Tuesday afternoon from the, the from the Chesapeake Bay all the way to Boston, rotating on the northeast winds. Now the system is dying out. It's filling up. It's weakening. Yeah, that's true. Okay, but you know that is what's going on. So pretty impressive. Now as we go further in time, this is. Uh, uh, next Sunday, October 18th, you can see the huge block in Baffin Island and Greenland, a very strong negative NEO, and that keeps the, the flow. We have a big anomaly here, the blue color, um, off uh, southeast uh, Canada and New England. So you're keeping the flow, you know, northwest, I guess west-northwest to east-southeast like this. Okay, and this block and this upper low here in the block sets up another pattern. So the GFS has another clipper which comes into the mid-Atlantic and goes boom um, on October 17th. And, uh, you know, that's the 12Z run. This is the 18Z run. I, I don't know if this is right, but given the upper air pattern we're seeing here, yeah, that's possible. So uh, it's pretty strong blocking here. Now, the blocking doesn't last very long. Um, the extended models aren't showing the blocking lasting very long. But... Um, yeah, that's what it looks like. Now, as we go further down the road, just to give you an idea, this here is the European model for October 31. It has some sort of negative anomaly in mid-Atlantic coast. It could be a storm there. The GFS is showing the same thing. It's much more aggressive with it as a bigger system. So it looks to me like there's something coming up towards the end of the month, a pretty significant event. Um, so we'll see if that actually happens or not. But, you know, you're getting that time of year. All right, let's talk about the uh, October snow cover here. And it seems like the snow cover has, in fact, continued to show significant improvement. Um, and you can see it here. Um, this is the October snow map as of um, October 8th. And um, one of the things you can see here is this is huge gap in the snow cover right in here. So a lot of snow cover to the north kind of weakness here. So this new weakness wants to fill in. That's the kind of thing we want to look. So let's look for this gap right in this part of Siberia and see what's going on here. Well, interestingly enough, the upper air patterns are coming in just the right place to fill in that gap. So this here is the current upper air map. You've got a giant upper low coming into central Siberia, another one north of Mongolia, another one nearby Chumkatka, and the block to the north bringing the cold air in. Okay, and this just continues this wave train of low pressure. It continues right across um, through uh, the weekend. And then uh, as we go beyond that, this is now next Wednesday. Uh, you get this huge blocking ridge to the north, sending the cold air southward, and this giant slow-moving up below, tracking right across exactly where you want it, Mongolia-Siberia border, moving very, very slowly. And then when it finally reaches to the eastern, eastern Siberia, we get this enormous storm by October 18th or 19th that just you know bombs out, pulling the Arctic air in, tons of snow. And to show you what I mean, um, look at the snow cover. So this is now. This is a week from now. Wow. I, I, I ignored the title. That's not what that is. Okay. I forgot to clean that out. So look at the snow cover. And then this is week two. Ready? You ready? You ready for week two? Okay. Week one. That's right now. Week one. Here's week two. Ready? Wow. Wow. That's extensive. A massive snow cover way below the 60 degree parallel line and it's also expanding to the west as well into central siberia which is nice to see so i'm impressed now again these are based on model projections i don't know if it's going to be right okay but i think they think they're pretty close to being accurate so all right that's the presentation again i apologize for the lateness of the video this is meteorologist dt from weather risk i will see you over on the uh blue sky uh, weather risk page over on uh, the Facebook page and over on the website.